As a pastor, what I find often happening to me is, is I'll meet someone in the grocery store and in the middle of the, the meat aisle, someone will start explaining to me how they have a problem with the Bible because there's such a change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And, and it's a hard thing for me to resist going into, uh, you know, there, it's actually very consistent and that from the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus quotes the Old Testament and we quote, he gives the two greatest commandments. And, and I resist getting into that. Because no one wants to talk about that while they're picking bacon. But um, there is one big disconnect between the Old and New Testament. And we have talked about it these last two weeks. Satan. In the Old Testament, the Satan is the job position. It's the person who God calls on to accuse or to block. It's like uh, God's scalpel. You never want to see God pick, pick him up. But it, it's still, you, could, you trust the one in control. And then you get into the New Testament, and it's completely different. In the New Testament, we have Satan as a name. Satan is the liar, the, the deceiver, the one who marshals the forces of evil to try to take on the kingdom of God. This is, every time that Jesus casts out a demon, this is one more skirmish between the war, between the kingdom of God and Satan who opposes it. That's where we left things last week, with this, this, this understanding the Gospels leave us of, of this grand battle across the heavens between God and Satan. We uh, then wrap up the, what the Bible has to say about Satan with uh, the Roman Empire, is what we're looking at when we look at Revelation. Revelation uh, talks about the beast, the, the seven-headed beast with ten horns, and seven, uh, the seven heads are the te seven emperors of Rome, and the ten horns, uh, Rome was founded on, on ten hills. And so it, it's, it's a pretty clear political cartoon not a funny ha-ha cartoon, but it's a pretty clear sort of serious political cartoon talking about how Satan is working through the Roman Empire. And, and this makes sense in light of the, the background of John, if you, the, the full, or the background of Revelation. For if you look at the full title of Revelation, it's the Revelation of John, right? And it's Revelation singular, Revelation of John. And if you go back to the Gospel of John, yes, they are connected. The, tempt, the way that Satan works in the Gospel of John is, for example, uh, when Satan tempts Jesus and Matthew and Luke, it's direct in, in, the, in the desert. J J uh, Satan shows up and says, hey Jesus, why don't you turn this, these rocks into bread? In John, the Gospel of John, Satan's temptations show up in people, through people. And that's the same logic we see in the revelation of John. Satan's temptation, Satan's work shows up through people, and in this case, through the Roman Empire. This is making the point that Satan can work through just about anything. It's not that the Roman Empire was satanic, but that Satan could work through it the same way that Satan could work through the people that Jesus ran into in his ministry. And so that's the logic we're left with at the end of, of the, the Bible, that Satan can work through uh, people or governments or systems. In the post-biblical times, this sort of calling out of Satan gets a little bit overboard because if anyone disagrees with you, you just say they're Satan spawn or they're in league with Satan. It was a viable argument that if, if you thought someone was a heretic, you said, well, you're obviously in line with Satan. What? I mean, but that was the logic that was used. And it, it continued down the road until uh, Martin Luther, great Reformation, right? He, uh, he called anyone who didn't agree with him in league with Satan. Catholic? Satan. If you're not uh, the same type of Protestant as him? Satan. If you disagree with him about the political structure and the rights of the peasants who revolt against their masters in Germany during the time of, of Luther? Satan spawn. I mean, so he, he, just, he just threw around uh, Satan. Just, if he didn't like you, you messed up his breakfast. Say, that's a bit far. But that's kind of the feeling it comes off with after a while, is there's this temptation, if, if you disagree with me, obviously you're in league with Satan. In the centuries that follow, in these centuries of Martin Luther, in the centuries following the, the, the biblical uh, text, the way that Satan is portrayed is almost always a, as a beast. The head of a... Let's go back one. Did I put that in the right order? Yes. That is one of the older pictures of Satan. And you, you see there's sort of bat wings and this big goat's head, and he's eating people, big enough just to grab people and eat them. If you go to the next one... 
Olivia and I were in uh, the Duomo, this very big church in Italy, and we're walking up these long stairs to get up to this huge dome. And as you come up to the dome, there's this dude waiting for you. And he's like big. And so you're looking up at this dude, and he is scary. It doesn't quite pop the same way as when it's like 30 feet on, on top of you and like looking at you. I mean, so Satan is kind of, he's a scary dude. And that is where Satan stays, this beastly, demonic, horrible thing, until one dude comes along. And he, the way he writes about it, we all know, that we, though we probably haven't all read Paradise Lost, it's, it's hard to read. I have a hard time reading. But it's Milton. In the 17th century, he writes Paradise Lost. And Milton is an odd person. For if you want to understand the beauties of God, the glory of God, the grace of Jesus, Milton is not the person to go to because he is a bitter, blind, angry man. He has to dictate most of the, the, his work because he's just angry at God and he's blind and he's angry at God for being blind. And he's a heretic as well. He, he believes that Jesus is less than God, um, so he doesn't go for the whole Trinity thing. And... and if you're looking for someone to help you understand God better, Milton is not the person to do it. But if you want to understand Satan better, maybe a blind, bitter heretic is exactly who you need to talk to. And he does help us understand uh, Satan far better. Because for him, Satan is not a beast like this. Satan is the next slide. Satan is the angel who fell, bat wings, but that's not scary. That's just another guy, right? Satan in the works of Milton... Satan in the book Paradise Lost is intriguing. He's the center of attention. He's the one who has all the great lines. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. You might not have read Paradise Lost, but you've all heard that line, haven't you? I mean, it, Milton gives Satan the most interesting role. He is the, the original anti-hero. He's the one who, he, he's the bad guy. He's the devil. You don't want to cheer for him, but he's so fun. And, and, and in Milton's works, Jesus is kind of boring. God the Father is kind of distant. Satan is where it's at. And so this idea of Satan as tempting, as beautiful, as interesting, that's what artists from then on take and play with. If you've ever read uh, Goethe, I believe is the way you pronounce it, G-O-E-T-H-E, you'll have to forgive my, my German, but I think it's Goethe, he writes, writes this book called Faust, and, and he talks of the Faustian bargain, where you, the, Satan will give you whatever you want in exchange for your soul when you die. And, and so this temptation that Satan will give you whatever you want, because Satan is so beautiful and so tempting, and, and it's Milton and Goethe who set us up for... Next slide, please. Al Pacino as the devil. Devil's Advocate. Who here saw Devil's Advocate? Right? I, I saw parts of it. But in Devil's Advocate, Al Pacino plays Satan. And if Satan in the form of Al Pacino comes by to have coffee and to ask you if you're interested, what are you going to say? Yeah. Sit down and tell me about it. You you you're going to. I, I know I would. If that's how Al Pacino knocks on my door, he is going to come in for coffee. It, that is how Satan transforms. Satan transforms to be the one who tempts you because he's so slick. He's so beautiful. He's so tempting. He's the one who says, you know, if one is good, why not have two? You enjoy one drink, have three. If, if you deserve the money, just go ahead and take it. No one's going to notice. Don't have to tell anyone. Sex is a natural thing. Go ahead and look. Go ahead and jump in. Do that some more. It feels good. Why not? That's what Satan is saying. The tempta the beast, the whore, big hairy dude, that's not tempting. Al Pacino, that, that, that's tempting. Or if this is more your... Uh, Viggo Mortensen plays Satan a little bit later if you, if you do dig more of the beard. But uh, both of them... This is uh, The Prophecy, another movie from the 90s. But if this is what is tempting to you, well, that, that's part of human nature. It's part of our culture today that pleasure... Instant pleasure, instant gratification looks good. We're tempted to give in to it. And the nature of Satan becomes clear because what he offers is like an addiction. The first time you, you enjoy whatever you're addicted to, it feels good. But the more you enjoy that addiction, the more you partake of that addiction, the less you enjoy it and the more it destroys your life. Satan, in a sense, 
I think that maybe one of the best understandings of Satan is to say he's like a parasite. He, he, sucks the, he offers something but then sucks the joy out of life and eventually destroys those who give in to his temptation. Well, that's all, that's sort of temptation and Satan up to just about recently. And, and in the recent years, I've started to read about people saying that Satan doesn't really exist. In modern times, I see sort of two extremes. I see, well, as I read theology, as I read other pastors, I see people going to one of two extremes. Either saying, Satan doesn't exist, but he is the projection of the worst in us. That Satan is the projection of our propensity to blame, to accuse. That evil doesn't actually exist, it's this absence and that you just don't have to worry about Satan because it's just not real. It's just part of our psychological issues and go talk to a shrink. On the other side, I get... I should have said psychologist, I'm sorry. I think shrink's a diminutive term. Let me try it again. You should go talk to a psychologist. Um, and on the other extreme, I hear people today talking about Satan as this active person who every time you go to the mall in Columbia and you don't get a parking spot, that's obviously Satan trying to mess with you. Satan must be fighting me going to Target because I didn't get it. No. No, and I think both of these extremes that I run in today kind of miss the central thing we're getting at when we're reading about Satan in the scripture. One, one approach just ignores that evil exists. One, one approach trivializes evil. Satan does not care if you have a parking spot. And that, that's not what we're... When we're reading about Satan in the Bible, we are talking about evil. And whether you personify that or not... Evil is real. Evil is powerful. Evil is in our world. And when Paul says that our struggle is with powers and principalities, he's right. There is more to addiction than just chemicals. There is more to depression than just an imbalance in our, in our brains. There is more to us than what we can touch. Right? Evil is real and powerful. And it is at work today. And so Satan seeks to destroy what is good, and you can ignore Satan, you can give Satan way too much power, but Satan, evil, is real in the world, and we know it's real because we can see its impacts. I won't use any local examples because that gets dicey, but to use big, broad national examples, how many politicians have suffered from a severe lack of the ability to keep their pants on? How many politicians have had their careers ruined because they gave in to temptation? Bill Clinton, John Edwards, David Petraeus, Mark Sanford. I mean, I, I looked up the list of, of, type in, politician sex scandal into Google. <laughs> You'll be there a while, right? And so, and, and it's not just that. There's the temptation to power. Why is Iraq in such a mess right now? Part of it is the lust for power, the temptation for power that El Maliki gave into the, this guy who's been the prime minister of uh, Iraq for eight years, and he could never share power, and he never shared power. He always had to have all the power, and what happened? Well, Iraq's blowing apart at the seams right now, right? And, and it's that uh, lust for power, it's in our national history, too. Nixon was going to win in a landslide no matter what. He didn't need Watergate, but he still did it, right? So this sort of lust for power, this, this temptation that Satan has, it is there and it is real and it destroys people's lives. And having spent now three weeks looking at this history of Satan, here's the punchline. How do we respond to this? How do we respond to Satan? How do we respond to the reality of evil in the world? Two ways I have for you this morning. First is we cultivate a deep sense of the beauty of the kingdom of God. If Satan offers a temptation and it looks good, it's hard to resist unless we have an even deeper appreciation for how beautiful it is to follow Jesus. If we are so deeply rooted in the beauty of the kingdom of God, in the satisfaction of God's kingdom, in the joy of discipleship, if we are so rooted in that, nothing else is going to look as good. This is... It's, this is like the question, how do you grow lots of lettuce and not have to worry about weeds? If you have a, a box to grow lettuce in and you don't, have to wor you don't want to have to worry about weeds, what are your options? You can either spend a lot of time weeding or you can fill the whole box with lettuce, right? If you fill the whole box with lettuce, where are the weeds going to come up? If you devote your life to, to the lettuce, if you devote your life to seeking the kingdom of God, where are the weeds going to grow? So first, grow more lettuce if you follow the, the imagery there. Second, 
the second response to Satan is to remember that we are not called to fight Satan. We're not called to fight. We are called to defend. If you look at in Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians, Paul lays out how we are to fight the powers and principalities. And he says, take up the shield, the breastplate, the shoes, the, sh- the helmet. He take up all, what are all of those things? They're armor, right? They're defensive. You put on the armor of God, the, the, lo- the belt of truth, the, the, sh- the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. And you put these things on and they are the shield against Satan's attacks. Even the sword, the, the, the last thing he says is pick up the sword, which is the word of God. This is all based upon a Roman legionary's outfit. And the Roman legionary, when they were on the offensive, they had a 10-foot spear. That's how far they kept their enemies away from them. 10-foot spears with big old long pointy things on the end. When it gets to the point where you're pulling out your short sword, itty bitty little short sword, as a Roman legionary, you're on the defensive. At the point you're pulling out the sword, you're defending yourself against an enemy who's already on top of you. And so... When we are grappling with Satan, we are not called to fight Satan. We are called to defend ourselves against Satan and then to to focus more fully on following Jesus. For if it is Satan who tempts us to believe that we are not able to be forgiven, that we are not accepted, that we are not loved, it is Jesus who reminds us that we are. Well, I have been preaching for just over eight years now, and this is the first time that I've really taken Satan and spent any time with, with him. This run of the, these three weeks. I don't pay a lot of attention to Satan because, as I said, we're not called to fight Satan. We're called to follow Jesus. Jesus has already done the hard part. Now we follow in his footsteps. We are called to offer good news, to be good news to each other, to accept what Jesus offers us. And as we are tempted along the way, we we refocus ourselves on the beauty of the kingdom of God, not the false beauty of Satan. We remember that we have all we need to defend against Satan, especially as we lean on each other and band together. There are times when I have been convinced that the powers and principalities, the power of evil, are at work. I truly believe evil is at work in the world against the church, against us, against individuals at times. But when this happens, I believe that's just a time to buckle down and to pray and get back to doing Jesus' will ever more committedly. And I don't say that out of a sense of naive ignorance, ignoring that there is real power, that evil has real power in the world. I say that because I believe that what we are called to have is a committed faith that understands that evil has already been defeated, that the power of sin and Satan was broken by Jesus on the cross, and that we are now called to follow Jesus and just leave Satan behind where he ought be. Amen.